Chapter 7 By the time we reached the house, Streaker was crouching down on the front step. Charlie's Alsatians were inching towards her, cheerfully showing great ranks of glittering teeth. As far as I could see, there was no escape. At that moment, a ginger cat sauntered round the side of the house. Now, you know as well as I do that dogs chase cats, but this cat was different. It was a monster. It hardly even looked like a cat. It was more like a ginger panther. As soon as it saw the three Alsatians, all its fur stood on end, so that it looked like an inflatable ginger panther. Its claws stuck out. It began to screech like some kind of creature from a horror film and held itself at Charlie's dogs. In two seconds flat, the dogs had vanished, tails between their legs. Tina and I grinned at each other. Eva's Streaker looked pleased, until the nightmare timed on her. Before we could do anything, the cat had flung itself at Streaker, and for a brief moment, it looked as if she was going to get shredded by the moggy from hell. But Streaker had quite a different idea up her sleeve. Not that dogs have sleeves, but I'm sure you know what I mean. If Streaker had got a sleeve, then that's where she would have kept her idea. Streaker turned, and this, quite astonishingly really, made a single flying leap from the front doorstep and straight through an open window. The cat plunged after her, and in no time at all, a fight had broken out inside. I started praying silently. Please don't let anything happen to Dad's phone. Tina peered desperately through the window while I banged on the front door. What's happening, I shouted, still thumping away with my fist and getting no answer. I don't know. I saw something large fly through the air. It may have been the cat, but I think it was your dad's mobile phone being a bit too uh, mobile. That was it. I had to do something. Pushing Tina away, I saw Streaker and the cat go sliding out of the room. I started clambering through the window. I've got to get to her. Supposing somebody comes, Tina asked anxiously. They're all out. I've got to get to Dad's phone. Got to get it back before it's completely smashed. Tina only hesitated a fraction longer. I'm coming too, she said, and hopped in behind me. There were quite a few tufts of fur flying around on the carpet, and some blank, some were black, and some ginger. I found a big plastic, a bit of plastic, and my heart dive bombed into my boots and hid there, squealing with terror. There's another bit over here, Tina called out helpfully, picking up a large but useless lump of X mobile phone. At least it wasn't the cat, she added. To find Streaker, all we had to do was follow the noise. The two animals seemed to have started round three upstairs. It was a bit spooky creeping around in someone else's house, so I hardly had time to think about it. This was an emergency. If Dad's phone was beyond repair, then I was going to end up in a hospital case. Tina and I had just reached the top of the landing when a door opened and as if by magic this woman appeared, wrapped in a towel, her face smeared all over with thick white paste and her head smothered in curlers. She looked so weird that I just stood there and screamed and so did she and she could scream much louder than me. Even Streaker and the cat stopped to see what the fuss was about. The woman grabbed the first thing that came to hand which happened to be a rather large and menacing laundry basket. She came straight at us yelling like a red Indian on a scalping mission. I was terrified and so was Tina and she yanked open the nearest door, dashed inside, pulled me in there and we slammed it shut behind us. It took one second to realise that Tina had made a big mistake. We weren't in a room at all. We were locked in a broom cupboard and it was dark and the handle was on the outside of the door and there was no way out. I sank to the floor and buried my head in my hands. Well done Tina, I murmured, nice one. It seemed like ages before we were released. I heard voices outside and the door was open and I stumbled out eyes blinking against the bright daylight and walked straight into the outstretched arms of a policeman. Well, 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 smirked Sergeant Smug. I used to think policemen only said well, well, well in bad films. Maybe this was a bad film. It certainly felt like a bad film to me. We've got two petty criminals red-handed breaking and entering private property with intent to steal. That's a jail sentence of five years or so. Listen, I began, it's all a big mistake. My dog came... Your dog, Sergeant Smug roared with laughter and turned to the lady. This is what he said last time. He always blames everything on his dog. There wasn't any dog, said the woman. Just these two on my landing. But there was, Tina insisted, and she tried to explain. The sergeant wouldn't have any of it, and we were carted off to the police station where they made a great show of taking our fingerprints and all our details before they would telephone our homes. Dad came to fetch us. He wasn't pleased. In fact, he was managing a pretty good imitation of an erupting volcano on two legs. This was because Streaker had finally returned home with half a mobile phone still strapped to her collar. The woman decided not to press charges against us, after all, because probably she could see that Dad having to go, ho- uh, having to go home with Dad was going to be far worse a sentence than going to jail. It would have been a lot safer in jail, I reckon. The one good thing was that when Dad discovered the smugs Alsatians had been involved, he had a real go at the sergeant. Dad didn't like the, smug- the smugs dogs any more than I did, so there you are. 
I had now ended up at the police station twice in one week. I still had to walk streaker, and I now owe Dad billions of pounds for a broken mobile phone. Life's wonderful, isn't it? Chapter 8. Parents do go on sometimes, don't they? On and on and on. I thought Dad would never let the subject drop. The first hour was the worst, of course, you know? What it's like. We've all been there. I never can understand when people shout when they get angry. What's the point? I usually, usually, they're standing so close to your ear holes as they can possibly get. So why do they have to shout? Dad had a good rant and a rave, and so did Mum. This bawling out was delivered in full de deluxe stereo, and there was nothing I could say in my defence. Well, what could I have said? I just let Mum and Dad get on with it, and patiently waited until they had finished. Then they began shouting at me, because they thought I wasn't listening. I ask you, even the Eskimos in Greenland were getting fed up with listening to them. Aren't you the least bit sorry? Dad repeated again and again, and his face kept switching from red to purple to white and back to red again. Of course I was sorry. I'd said I was sorry 50 times already, but apparently that wasn't enough. I wanted to say, look, Dad, me saying sorry for the millionth time is not going to repair your mobile phone. I had a strong feeling that probably wasn't a good idea. But you're going to have to pay for a replacement, Dad growled vengefully. Where do parents get these crazy ideas from? There was no way I had the money to pay for a mobile phone. If I walked streaker until Christmas, I still wouldn't have enough money. Secondly, all my pocket money comes from mum and dad in the first place. If you look at it logically, that meant they would be buying the mobile phone with their own money anyway. Another strong feeling told me that it would not be a good idea to point this out to my parents. Luckily, mum asked dad if the phone had been insured, and it had. That meant all dad had to do was ring the insurance company and tell them that Streaker had run off with it with some monster moggy and had eaten it, and they would pay for a replacement. Dad was quite pleased when he realised this. I'm sure he knew there was no chance of me coming up with the money. On the other hand, he was still annoyed because he reckoned I was getting off lightly. How long were you trying out this totally stupid idea of yours, he asked. About half an hour. Half an hour? Another explosion from Dad. I was beginning to reckon that if there was some way of harnessing Dad's power to the station, his explosions could be turned into enough electricity to light up half the country. Imagine it. People would be sitting at home when their lights began to dip and someone would say, Hey, lights are fading. Somebody go and poke Trevor's dad. That'll get him going again. Half an hour, repeated Dad. Do you know how much it costs for a half an hour call on a mobile? This is another continual source of astonishment to me. I'm 11. Does Dad really think I know how much phone calls cost? I cut a long, bawling out short Dad. Decided I must have run up a bill of at least £5, which I would have to repay. Dad seemed to find fairly satisfied now that he had delivered his punishment and I was left in peace. At last, so that was another £5 gone. So far, I had lost at least £10 because of paying for the dog biscuits and the phone bill. And I hadn't actually earned anything yet. I decided to keep a low profile for a while. You know how it is. When your parents get in one of their blame you for everything moods. Mum ran out of yoghurt. That was my fault. Dad couldn't find his golfing cap. That was my fault. The car wouldn't start. That was my fault. They kept glaring at me and muttering, what's that boy been up to now? I wanted to jump up and confess. Yes, it was me. I really don't know what made me do it. I must have been born to be bad. I filled Dad's golfing cap with yoghurt and stuffed it in the car's petrol tank. Needless to say, I kept quiet. I didn't go and see Tina for a couple of days and walked Streaker by myself, which was a real chore. I was getting desperate. Over half the holiday had gone and I still hadn't trained Streaker. And just to make matters worse, I discovered that Charlie Smug had tipped in a tin of frog spawn to the bath. There were great dollops of translucent grey jelly slopping about on the top of the scummy water. I stood and stared, imagining what it was going to be like climbing into that disgusting, clammy gunge. Charlie couldn't go around doing things like that. It was cheating. I was going to tell Tina. I bumped into Charlie on the way there, or rather he bumped into me. Watch her, lover boy. Off to see your girlfriend. Charlie's got such a tremendous imagination, I don't think. I looked him straight in the eye. You've been up at the field. Yeah. You put frogs board in the bath. I never. It must have been the frogs. What frogs? The only frog I saw was a frog pushing a shopping trolley across the field with a bucket of frogs born in it. Charlie was really startled at first. Where were you? I never saw you. And then he grinned. So what if I did? He said, cockily. What are you going to do about it? He stepped closer and towered over me. Have you ever noticed that when people are far away, you can feel really brave about facing up to them? I reckon it's because when you're far away, they look a lot smaller, so you're not too scared. Unfortunately, the closer they get, the bigger they get. And at that precise moment, Charlie Smug was looking very big indeed.
It's cheating, I insisted, and all at once I saw a way of getting out of the bet. You've cheated and that means the bet's off. We're not going to bathe in that old tin tub. Charlie folded his huge arms across his chest. I don't care, he sneered, because if you don't get your in yourselves, I'll just pick you up and put you in. You got it? He reached out, seized me by both arms and lifted me six, in six inches clear of the pavement. I could feel his fingers like iron bands squeezing around my puny arms. My heart was thundering away and I really thought I was going to become strawberry jam. Charlie shoved his fat, pimply face really close to mine. See what I mean? He grinned and plonked me back down. He pushed past and went up the road laughing. I was not in a good mood when I reached Tina's and by the time I finished telling her about Charlie, well, she wasn't happy either. Frogspawn? Yes, Frogspawn. There wasn't any Frogspawn in there before. It's bubbling all over the place with the stuff now. Tina was seething. He can't do that. It's against the Geneva Convention. We'll take him to the European Court of Human Rights. I nodded glumly. Yeah, we can't do things like that. Trouble, little, or, trouble is, he has. After my most recent encounter with Charlie, I knew for certain there was absolutely no chance of escaping our fate unless we wanted to become the latest batch of strawberry jam. I didn't think life could get any worse. Streaker was uncontrollable and we were doomed to be drowned in Frogspawn. Who also gets me, I grumbled. What also gets me, I grumbled, is that everybody seems to think we're in love. They think you're my girlfriend. You don't have to look so disgusted at the idea, Tina pointed out. Well, you know what I mean. They're all stupid. Yeah, Tina said. Her face had this strange look on it, as if she was smiling, but she wasn't. At least her mouth wasn't, if you see what I mean. Cheer up, she said. You're such a pessimist. We haven't lost this bet yet, and there are still some of their £30 left. I've been thinking about Streaker, and I've had an idea. What? Tina the organiser? I'm the ideas man. I glanced at her suspiciously. Yeah? What is it? 